A logo. Ideas that work. U.S. Office of Special Education Programs. A title. 2011 OSEP Project Directors Conference. Tuesday, July 19, 2011. Keynote presentation. From Bach to Lady Gaga. Music Lessons for Special Education. David Rose, EDD, Center for Applied Special Technology. Cast. Title, Renee Bradley, Conference Chair, OSEP. A couple of years ago, maybe about five or six years ago, we um, began a tradition at the conference of honoring one of our own. So someone that has been a part of the Part D discretionary um, grants that has um, had a long-standing contribution, substantial contribution to the field. And it's not like a lifetime achievement or historical recognition. In David's case, it might be hysterical recognition. Um, but uh, we like to think of these folks as um, the folks that, whose shoulders the next generation will stand on as we can um, continue our effort. So, and they all tend to fuss at me a little bit um, when we talk about what they're going to talk about. Because our directions to them are, we'd like you to reflect a little bit on your work and the field of special education. And we'd like you to kind of inspire those that are continuing and will come behind you um, to have um, as a, the best chance at um, substantial uh, contributions as they have had. So they always um, have this little retrospective journey, and then I hear about it from them repeatedly for years. But um, anyway, uh, this year I'm very pleased uh, to introduce Dr. David Rose. His longer bio is in your program, but I will add a few of the kind of things about the man that you might not know from um, his bio. He has uh, two grown children. Uh, one is a medical doctor who um, practices her profession in high poverty neighborhoods. His son is a lawyer specializing in, what do you think? Special education, bad influence of a father here. So um, he is a trumpet player in his spare time. He practices, he calls safe juggling, not to be confused with knives and chairs, et cetera, but safe juggling. Um, and he told me that kind of one of the biggest reflections he took away from this was that he used to consider himself more as a, um, a neuropsychologist. And as he moves through his career, he more and more wants to be identified as an educator. And that's the stuff that he's most proud of. So he is always one of my favorite educators to listen to. I think by the title alone, you know that we are in for a treat. And it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. David Rose from Bach to Lady Gaga. Renee hugs David Rose as he heads to the podium. David Rose, EDD, Center for Applied Special Technology, CAST. Thank you for this chance to speak to everyone. and. Um, I appreciate the honor in doing so, and I also want to say that I'm clearly here because of the enormous work of the people at CAST, and I'm just representing that work. A graphic. CAST. Universal Design for Learning. 25 plus years. Joy Zabala uh, and Chuck Hitchcock are both here, and then about 45 other people back home. I wanted to say why music. I'm going to talk a lot about music today. Um, in reflecting, I realized that at a number of key points, I've used music to make my point when I've been teaching. And I'm not a great musician at all. Um, and it made me pause to think about why I would do that. And I realized that, in fact, it's always been a alternate representation, um, that when I'm trying to get to a hard thing, um, I guess I've instinctively always wanted to find another, um, another means to get there, another representation of the point. So what I have chosen to do is to reflect back a bit and come up to the future, um, telling uh, the story of uh, where I've been and where I think we're going uh, entirely through music today. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, some of these, a little bit, a couple of chestnuts that I've certainly talked about before. But like anything, I've found uh, that I've learned a whole lot of new things, both from the music and from the special education that I will get to. So back to Lady Gaga. 
A title slide contrasts a portrait of a stoic Bach with his curled powdered wig and Lady Gaga, whose platinum blonde hair is fashioned into a bow at the top of her head. From Bach to Lady Gaga, music lessons for special education. The first part of my career was looking uh, for universals. A title slide, Roman numeral one, looking for universals. I was a developmental psychologist uh, teaching uh, at, in child development at Tufts University. And um, I needed a way to have kids understand, have students understand the big global universals of child development. And I think most of you are familiar with all of this work, but um, this was the first talk I ever gave that I actually liked. And I used Beethoven's Eroica. So I'd like to just play a little bit of Beethoven's Eroica for you. Western music notation for Symphony No. 3 in E-flat major, Eroica, the five-line bass and treble clefs are crowded with notes and cymbals. Okay, so I would typically stop it there and um, ask the students what would have been the reaction to that music when it was premiered in Leipzig in 1805. A sketch of historic Leipzig shows a city intersection with four-story masonry buildings with terracotta tile roofs. Pedestrians and horse carriages share the streets. And a discussion would ensue and people would ask the right questions. Well, uh, it depends on what was music like and how different was this and all of those things. So we'd get out a lot of the ideas in that time Piaget was the major figure. So we'd get out the idea of the progressions that Piaget talked about and how change happens. So then I'd have to get into the music a little bit to talk about, well, what was this like compared to the music they were listening to? Was it the same thing? Was it very different? So on. So I just want to play a few, um, just one more passage from this. In the score, notes are placed on the clefs according to their pitch. All of this would have seemed to write that. All this would have seemed very familiar, very classic, very Mozart and Haydn. This gets a little scary. David Rose furrows his brow and looks down. music. Okay, now what I want you to do is listen to the chords that are coming up. Notice everything's off the beat. Sync of patience. A lot of power coming. Try to hit the beat. Can't find the beat. He tries to nod in time with the music. Dissonant chords coming. Back to beautiful. It's those chords. We come again, last chords. Listen to these. Nothing's on the beat. Dissonance. Too much, in some ways for Leipzig in 1805. Um, in fact, uh, there was, as you might expect, um, quite a reaction. 
And uh, here's one reaction was shouted out in the middle. By the way, it's much longer, vastly, two to three times longer than any symphony they had heard before. And so here's my uh, favorite comment. A quote appears on screen. I'll give another Kreutzer if it will just stop. <laughs> A very mixed reaction. Um, because, in fact, if this is the periods of classical music, if we look at where did the Eroica happen? A timeline appears. The Eroica happened right at the end of the classical stage of music. The Renaissance stage ends at 1650. Baroque ends at 1750. Classical ends at 1820. Romantic ends at 1900, followed by the modern stage. Eroica is placed on the timeline just before classical ends in 1820. And it brought those new chords, the syncopation, the, uh, uh, the great uh, colossal chords that were uh, not harmonious in the way that the previous uh, period had had them. And in fact, what happened was people had to do what Piaget talks about. A slide. Universals in child development cognitive stages. Assimilation, accommodation, and perturbation. They were in a stage called the classical period. And to assimilate this music, they had to actually accommodate how they understood music, that it could include these stretches of emotion, these difficult chords, these dissonances that didn't sound right. But it was so close to classical period that, in fact, they were able to accommodate and say, or at least a lot of people, that does feel like music. But music must be different than I thought music really was. The slide reappears. Assimilation, accommodation, and perturbation. And lots of you remember from your old days words like perturbation. Beethoven's Eroica was the perfect perturbation in 1805 based enough on classical symphonies that it could be assimilated, but enough of a stretch that we had to accommodate music. And here's a great quote from Grout's History of Music. Romantic or not, because the question was, is it romantic music or classical? Beethoven's music was the most powerful disruptive force in the history of music. It opened the gateway to a whole new kind of music right at that transition. I like the idea of the disruptive force, but the key thing was the idea of regular stages, that there was a transition from a stage like classical that everybody was in to a stage like romantic that, uh, that Beethoven ushered in. From that though, when I was teaching child development, I was looking for universals. What are the big things that you could tell kids uh, about the way children develop? But the same concert actually brings up the point which was to dominate the rest of um, my life for sure. And that is what's really universal about what happened in 1805 in Leipzig is its variability. A title slide, Roman numeral two. What is really universal? Variability. And there was everything. There was people who thought it was the most gorgeous piece of music ever and people who just wanted it to stop that variability was what Beethoven faced in 1805. So I want to talk a little bit about variability. A slide titled David versus Ruth features two portraits, David and his wife, Ruth. This is uh, my wife, Ruth, and I, and uh, there's variability between us in regards to music. Ruth has perfect pitch. Perfect pitch means that Whenever a note is played, Ruth knows exactly what it is. It doesn't have to sing to herself or think about it. It's just the way that you recognize orange. When someone plays a 440 A, she just says A. She can't even stop herself. The label perfect pitch appears below Ruth's portrait. The label not so much appears below David's. Me, not so much. <laughs> I have a generalized view of pitch. Things are high and low, and it's probably much closer uh, to the way that most of you are. Um, and we know something about the neuroscience of perfect pitch now. A sketch of the profile of a human brain has a pink highlighted area near a central fold. And you can probably see this little pink highlighted area on auditory cortex. And we know that, in fact, people with perfect pitch have a difference there. There's actually a couple things that have been found recently. 
a slide, the neurology of Ruth, hyperconnected, and asymmetric planum temporale, a graphic depicts two pairs of right and left hemisphere brain regions. In the top pair, labeled NMUS, the regions are similar in size. In the lower pair, labeled APMUS, the right hemisphere is much smaller than the left. One is they seem hyperconnected. If you really look at the close anatomy, there's more connections, more synapses, more interconnections among the parts there, hyperconnected. And there's an asymmetry. It's much larger, this area for pitch, on the left than on the right. So we can look at someone's brain and say, wow, that's a great brain for perfect pitch. The question, though, that I would like to ask you and myself is, who has a disability? Portraits of David and Ruth. So for Ruth, who grew up in a very musical family and all that, um, for Ruth, her view of happy married life ahead came from the sound of music. And it would be that we would have a bunch of kids and we'd be traveling in a Volkswagen bus, this is 1969, uh, singing in eight-part harmony. And that would glue a marriage together. Um, and to her, discovered way too late in our relationship, the idea that I had this small BB size area on the left planum temporale was a bitter disappointment. Um, and the, even worse, that I passed it on largely to our kids. Um, so that, in fact, we can't sing an eight-part harmony. Um, and so to Ruth, for whom all of this is so natural and easy, she has this very disabled family that she travels with. And it's hard for her to even picture what it must be like to go around in life and have no idea what the pitch of music is or what I'm supposed to sing next, OK? But the lesson of this for me over the last decade has been understanding disability in a much richer way. So uh, if we change context, disabilities change dramatically. So I want to tell you about a different context. This one, I look much better. We go to a church together, Ruth and I. And in church, it's my one chance uh, during the week to sing. And I think you're supposed to sing. So I sing loud, and I, I'm out there. But of course, I'm really not on the, exactly the note that's in the hymn book. And so picture Ruth. Um, here she is. She looks at the note in the hymn book, and she knows exactly what to sing. But I'm not really singing that. And I'm next to her, and we have 45 years of marriage, and there's some reason to want to figure out how she can make this work for me, too. But the person on her other side is also not singing at 440. And we go to this really old New England church, and the organ has long ago drifted away from 440. It's not even playing A anymore. <laughs> so for Ruth, singing at church is a terrible consternation. And she can't really do it because the notes in the book and the people around her and the organ, they're all weird and not right, except for the ones in the book. So Ruth doesn't, doesn't sing with joy. And I love the beautiful irony of being in church where everybody else in the church, more like me than her, I think of them as looking around and saying, isn't it too bad about Ruth? She married somebody who can't <laughs> sing. She could have married better. I know they all think that. Um, so the disability is, in fact, entirely contextual. So individual differences became of great interest to me, and, um, and especially the way in which we think about things like disability, who's disabled and who's not. Um, so I want to go just a little bit more into uh, the nervous system here. Three sketches of the brain appear. In the first, the rear portion of the brain is shaded and labeled recognition networks. In the second, the front portion is shaded and labeled strategic networks. The third sketch is a cross-section labeled affective networks. Some of you know this. We typically divide up the brain, as many do, into three sort of large networks that help us understand things like music. 
the back of your brain is an area that's devoted to recognizing things, taking information in from the outside world and turning it into usable knowledge. In a slide showing the brain image with the back area shaded, an arrow points to the center of the shaded rear portion of the brain. A list appears, pitch, timbre, duration, loudness, contour, and direction. Right where these arrows are roughly in auditory cortex, you actually have a lot of things you recognize about sound. It's pitch, timbre, duration, loudness, contour, direction. There's even a longer list. The direction means where is it coming from. Auditory cortex has a, a whole host of things. It's learning from sound. It's fabulous. And you do that with the back uh, part of your brain, and people really differ. Some people be really good at any of these, and some people be really bad at them. And there's usually a normal distribution. It actually grows over time. A slide shows a series of five brains with highlighted active areas. The first, representing a five to seven-year-old brain, has a small active area in the center. Children, as they grow up, learn to engage more cortex in the listening to music because they make more meaning out of it. The next two brains represent 9 to 11-year-old non-musicians and musicians. The non-musician's brain has a slightly larger active area relative to the younger brain, but the musician's active area is larger still. Those things I showed were just the common initial elements of music, but we actually then make meaning, make emotion out of that music, and that will require a lot more of our brains. The last two brains represent adults. The non-musician's active area is larger than any of the children's active areas. The adult musician's brain shows the most activity, with even more of the visible surface area highlighted. You can see the difference here between non-musicians. Musicians turn out to have brains that you can see and say, oh my gosh, that's an expert brain listening to that music. Look how much they get out of that music. So those individual differences are key. But there's actually more to the brain that um, I think you've probably seen that there's a bunch of books that have come out recently about music and the brain. The slide showing all three brain networks reappears. There are actually three broad areas, same ones we talk about in UDL. A slide of the brain with the rear area shaded, representing the recognition network. We recognize the sounds and make meaning out of them with the back part of our brain. A slide of the brain with the front area shaded, representing the strategic network. With the front part of our brain, though, this is where expertise comes, where we learn the strategies to attack music, to listen to it intentionally and carefully, to be an expert listener, and also to be able to make music. This is the expressive half of our brain, the front part, to be able to actually generate, compose, and make music. So music requires both being able to perceive and make sense of it, Secondly, be able to make music and uh, attend to it carefully. A slide of a brain cross-section with the shaded inner area representing the affective network. But then thirdly, at the center of our brains, right where it should be, the most powerful and important things of our brain, are the parts of our brains that make priorities, that say this is important and this is less important. Uh, for those of you that are into this, limbic lobe uh, writ large, affective networks that say, that guide us by saying, this is of value to me. This is frightening, this is exciting. These are the value networks uh, that uh, really uh, push everything else, push and pull everything else. So when we listen to music, actually, uh, we listen with all three of those parts of our brain. A slide titled Music and Variability shows three MRI-like brain images with various areas highlighted in different colors. I've shown the first one here, recognition networks. The first brain image, labeled recognition networks, shows a small highlighted area in the middle, just behind a central fold. Auditory cortex listens to the elements of sound and makes them into music. But strategic networks are the front of our brain. This is showing a person who's actually a jazz musician making music. The second brain image, labeled strategic networks, shows colorful highlighted areas throughout the brain, but concentrated in the front. And then what lights up is the front part of the brain. The front part of the brain lights up like crazy because he's making music, not just listening to it. The third image, labeled Affective Networks, features a cross-section with highlighted activity deep in the center of the brain. And thirdly, 
when we listen to music, we listen with the center of our brain. We listen with affect. The whole point of music is to make us feel something. So the more they study, you have to be more careful in your studies, we find it's the center of the brain that lights up with music because we feel it. And that's what the composer was hoping we'd do. So with that kind of tripartite view, people have begun to study and see there's individual differences everywhere in how we perceive and make sense of music, in how we generate, compose, and uh, perform music, and how we feel about music. These are all incredibly different. So all of these images are average. When you look at across individuals, you see very different patterns. A slide, Roman numeral three, meeting the universal challenge of variability, universal design for learning. Meeting that challenge is what's been the latter part of my work and the work at CAS, is meeting the challenge, which is universal, of variability. I want to stress that point that what is really universal isn't what Piaget found. What is really universal is the variability itself. We are incredibly variable. And universal design for learning is an attempt to, how do we meet the challenge of that variability? Um, so now I'd like to uh, kind of flesh this out a little bit. And I know you're already saying, where's the music? OK, so now we're getting into the more heavy music part of the talk. Um, so I'd like to uh, play uh, just a little bit of uh, Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor. One other part. Oh, one more section. I'll make sense of this later. hard to make sense of that piece, although it's a beautiful piece. Um, so what we talk about in UDL is providing multiple representations as a way to help people make sense, to make meaning out of these things. I want to show you a neat representation, not one we made, but I'll tell you how to get it later. So this is going to be a multiple representation, two representations rather than one. Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor is represented in the following sequence as a series of colorful bars that scroll across the screen. As individual notes are heard, they highlight on the screen. Short bars represent short notes, and longer bars represent sustained notes. Bars corresponding to low notes appear low on the screen, while higher notes are represented above them. A chord of several notes is visualized as several bars. A series of descending notes graphically suggests a descending staircase. Watch this next section. Look how clear the structure becomes. A flat dotted line represents the staccato repetition of a single note, which is interwoven with another series of notes appearing as a curved, dispersed dotted line. I hope you like that. Um, I want to talk about what's happening here. From a UDL perspective, we have uh, 
The first principle is provide multiple representations. Back half of the brain, how do we present enough representations? And uh, there are several things I just want to highlight that we did in that passage. A slide, Roman numeral one, provide multiple means of representation. The slide includes three guidelines with subpoints. One of the guidelines is provide options for perceptions. Make sure everybody can perceive this. The first guideline, provide options for perception. Subpoint 1.1, offer ways of customizing the display of information. 1.2, offer alternatives for auditory information. And 1.3, offer alternatives for visual information. And in this case, we're offering alternatives for the auditory information. Because its primary form was auditory, let's give an alternative, which is visual. Second guideline, provide options for language, mathematical expressions, and symbols. Subpoint 2.1, clarify vocabulary and symbols. 2.2, clarify syntax and structure. 2.3, Support decoding of text, mathematical notation, and symbols. 2.4. Promote understanding across languages. And 2.5. Illustrate through multiple media. People are going to really differ in their ability to know what the symbols and the words, the expressions that are written, all of those are very different uh, by different individuals. And in this case, um, one of the things that the visual can do because of the difference between vision and hearing, which is to say vision is able to allow you to think things simultaneously, hearing much more sequentially. So you're able to actually clarify the syntax and structure a bit of this piece. And we're obviously illustrating through multiple media. Let's choose a bunch of different media. It does a few other things. That is, notice it puts the music into a simpler form than a notation system on the graphic, which is impenetrable to lots of people. So it supports the decoding of the music. But I want to go a little bit deeper into this piece and show how the representations get us at a higher level. Uh, first, I want to give you some background knowledge. And what I'm going to do now is talk about the things that we've learned, essentially, from all of you in this room. What are the things one does from our evidence-based work that would make representations clearer to different individuals. So at CAST, all we've done is taken your work and say, how do we embed that in things so that it's there always when we need it? So I'm going to give you some background knowledge. We could just attach it to that uh, figure. But to tell you what a fugue is, because we're going to move to the fugue. David Rose reads from a slide. A fugue is a composition built on a theme that is introduced at the beginning, repeated in different voices and contexts, and recurs frequently in the course of the composition. Is everybody with me on a fugue? A single theme, we're gonna see it in a bunch of voices, a bunch of contexts, and many times. Okay, so that's uh, background knowledge, what a fugue is. And then I'm gonna do a few things which we could do electronically, but I'm gonna do them as a voice just so that it gives me a role here. I'm gonna skip ahead. David Rose searches on his nearby laptop. Notice how easy it is to find your place in the music, too. You can just look for it, okay? So here's the end of the toccata, and the fugue is about to start. This is a theme. Aha, another theme. Same one. A pattern of bars emerges, a flat dotted line and a curved dotted line. Now they play with each other a little bit. Just a little echo. Holy cow, I hope you can see another theme is coming. The curved line starts at the same level as the flat line. It swoops downward, then back up. Let me skip just a little bit ahead to the part that I played it's very complicated. Watch these themes. As many bars scroll across the screen, the theme stands out in its own color, first in green at the bottom, then in other colors and pitches. Here it comes again in the alto. Two curved lines stand out in a different color than the other notes.
drums. You can see them coming. In the low notes. Upside down. The curved line arcs over the flat line. Right side up. Upside down again. The curved dispersed dotted line appears again. I think you're getting the feel for how you can see some of these things much easier. Now, that's not true for everyone. I have an individual that I go to church with, actually, who uh, uh, has had a brain injury. And uh, for him, actually, music is an intensely important part of his life. And he's very good. He's a mathematician, very good at listening to music. So I did this for him, and he says, I already knew that. He actually heard all of those internal upside downs and reversals and all of that. He heard it, which seems incredible to me. But I said, give me a break. Let me listen to it with the visuals on. And he said, fine, OK. But then I will say, he got totally into watching it. And uh, we did it together. And then he finally said, you know what? There were ones in there I never heard, which I thought was cool. Uh, I don't win many arguments with him. A multiple representation allows us to do a number of things. And just to highlight back to the third guideline under representation, provide options for comprehension. Guideline 3, sub point 3.1, activate or supply background knowledge. 3.2, highlight patterns, critical features, big ideas, and relationships. 3.3, .3, .3, guide information processing, visualization, and manipulation. 3.4, maximize transfer and generalization. How are we going to perceive it? Not just how are we going to know what's symbolically and structurally there, but how are we going to actually make meaning? So I did something to activate a little background knowledge to tell you what a fugue is to give you a sense of where we're going. And then the colors, the individual who did this made the colors highlight the patterns, the critical features. You've heard all this language because this is the research you've done just instantiated in a digital medium to say, let's highlight the pattern so people can see them as well as hear them. The slide is shown again. And then guiding information processing, that I try to talk a little bit above it to guide where to look, look here, so on, as good teachers do, and as good media, when we design media well, can do as well. Those are the three principles um, about representation, a principle about making sure everybody can perceive it, making sure all the symbols are uh, available to everybody and making sure uh, that there are the supports that we know to work built in for comprehending it, really understanding it. So here they are just highlighted with that piece of music. So now I want to go to variability in, in, this, in the front part of the brain. And uh, these I know are too small. I realize that you're a long way away. So uh, I'm not going to go into them in anywhere near the detail I just did. A slide, Roman numeral two, provide multiple means of action and expression. The slide also includes three guidelines and their subpoints. There are guidelines for action and expression. What are the ways in which we provide enough options so everybody can express what they need to express? The first are, do we have options for physical action itself? Can everybody act? Guideline four, provide options for physical action. Subpoint 4.1, vary the methods for response and navigation. And 4.2, optimize access to tools and assistive technologies. Secondly, are there the skills? Guideline 5, provide options for expression and communication. Subpoint 5.1, use multiple media for communication. 5.2, use multiple tools for construction and composition. And 5.3, build fluencies with graduated levels of support for practice and performance. There are skills required that there might be other ways, other skills in which we could use for communicating. And lastly, thirdly guideline, options for executive function. Not about the movements, not about them organized into skills, but about can you plan and organize a whole expression. Guideline six, provide options for executive functions. Subpoint 6.1. Guide appropriate goal setting. 6.2, support planning and strategy development. 6.3, facilitate managing information and resources. And 6.4, enhance capacity for monitoring progress. 
What I want to now play is a uh, wonderful tape. This is from uh, Todd Makeover at uh, the Media Lab at MIT with Dan Elsie. It's Dan Elsie you see on the screen, and Dan Elsie has CP. He's in a institutional school in Tewksbury. But this wonderful work, and for points I want to make later, began with Dan and has emerged into a whole way of thinking of making and performing music that's different. But it began with people like Dan. So let's uh, listen to uh, Todd Makeover. Todd speaks at a technology, entertainment, and design conference. A background slide titled Personal Instrument features a young man wearing a headband pointing device. And if you're going to make personal opera, what about a personal instrument? Everything I've shown you so far, whether it's a hyper cello for Yo-Yo Ma or a squeezy toy for a child, the instruments stay the same and are valuable for a certain class of person, a virtuoso, a child. Um, but what if I could make an instrument that could be adapted to the way I personally behave, to the way my hands work, to what I do very skillfully, perhaps to what I don't do so skillfully. I think this is the future of interfaces, the future of, of music, the future of instruments. I love the way he says that. This is the future. This is a graduate student. It's about three minutes. It's a little longer than I should play. But I want you to hear how he describes what they're doing from a person who isn't in our field, a beautiful, by working long enough with an individual with disability, a beautiful coming to recognize what's really needed. And I love the expression of it. Dan Elsie, the young man wearing the headband pointing device in the photo, now sits in his wheelchair on stage. He turns his head toward the graduate student. Um, so Todd and I entered into a discussion following the Tewksbury work, and it was really about how Dan is an expressive person, and he's an intelligent and creative person. And it's in his face, it's in his breathing, it's in his eyes. How come he can't perform one of his pieces of music? That's our responsibility, and it doesn't make sense. So we started developing a technology that will allow him, with nuance, with precision, with control, and despite his physical disability, to be able to do that, to be able to perform his piece of music. So the process and the technology, basically, first, we needed an engineering solution. So you know, we have a firewire camera. It looks at an infrared pointer. We went with the type of sort of um, gesture metaphor that Dan was already used to with his talking, um, with his speaking controller. Uh, and this is actually the least interesting part of the work. You know, it was a design process. We needed an input. We needed continuous tracking. In the software, we look at the types of shapes he's making. Um, but then was the really interesting aspect of the work uh, following the engineering part, where Basically, we were coding over Dan's shoulder at the hospital extensively to figure out, you know, how does Dan move? What's useful to him as an expressive motion? You know, what's his metaphor of performance? What types of things does he find important to control and convey in a piece of music? And so all the parameter fitting and really the technology was stretched at that point to fit just Dan. And, you know, I think this is a, a, a perspective shift. It's not that our technologies they provide access, they allow us to create pieces of creative work. But what about expression? What about that moment when an artist delivers that piece of work? You know, do our technologies allow us to express? Do they provide structure for us to do that? And, you know, that's a personal relationship to expression um, that is lacking in the technological sphere. So, you know, with Dan, we needed a new design process, a new engineering process to sort of discover his movement and his path to expression that allow him to perform. Later. A camera is mounted in front of Dan. Todd explains as the graduate student connects equipment to a computer. It's going to be looked at by this camera, analyze his movements. It's going to let Dan bring out all the different aspects of his music that he wants to. I just want to stop to say, so this is a piece that Dan is in composed in an instrument that I'll show you in a moment. But it's his composition, but now he's also conducting it. When Dan makes music, his motions are very purposeful, very precise, very disciplined, and they're also very beautiful. So in hearing this piece, as I mentioned before, the most important thing is the music's great, and it'll show you who Dan is. Todd and the graduate student step aside as Dan moves his head while watching the computer monitor. Dan's head bobs forward and back and swishes side to side. Dan's mouth contorts and smiles as he makes music. Multiple representation of the sound.
On a large screen, the audience sees a computer representation of the music, a sinuous line that thickens and moves as it follows the movements of the pointer. Dan smiles as he performs, shaking and nodding his head. A woman in the audience wipes her eye. Back to Dan Elsie. Just in the interest of time, I'm going to jump ahead. You'll be able to hear this over. Dan's head traces swirling shapes. Dan's nods seem to coincide with the low chords. On screen, a dense landscape of looping lines accumulate against a black field. The receding background lines are deep red, while the fresher lines in the foreground are bright yellow. The line seems to reach forward as it builds. He directs his gaze high and to his right. The concert audience rises for a standing ovation. Back to David Rose. Um, here's what came out of that work, um, was a, a new kind of making music instrument, which doesn't re rely on bars and graphs and things, but by taking the shapes of music, putting them in a computer where they could be accessible uh, to Dan, uh, but actually more accessible to everybody. And out of this kind of work, came Guitar Hero and all of the garage band, all that kind of stuff. It came out of looking for what's a better interface than making notes on graph paper uh, for creating music. Um, so it begins to do all of these things. The only thing it doesn't do, because Dan didn't need it, is sort of how do we support his executive functions of planning? And that um, is another story we can get to in another longer day. Um, I wanted to just mention only a couple days ago, I went back to the Glee site where I found something that was much more personally relevant to me, um, which is it has a, this is, they have games you can play at the Glee site uh, that are relevant to the show. They don't call them games, they call them extras. But one of them was a sing your own song in a, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, when you go to a, a, yes, karaoke, thank. See, I need scaffolding. Um, so when you go to a karaoke bar, uh, you sing. But if you're like me, you would never go to karaoke bar because you're not going to actually be on pitch and it sounds terrible. Well, what I love is the Glee site gets that. The one that is great is it has the professional pitch correction that, as you know, professional singers use all the time. So it just says, sing in here, and then it says, okay, do you want to correct your pitch? And you go, whoop, and you, you know, I can, you sound fabulous. Okay, so for me, the ability to move into, I can sing the song and I can get scaffolding on the pitch is fabulous. Just these things are available, I want you to know. Lastly, the third principle has to do with the most important thing, Provide multiple means of engagement, a third principle. A slide, Roman numeral three. Provide multiple means of engagement. The graphic includes three guidelines with subpoints. That's that third central core part of the uh, nervous system. And I'm just going to read a few things to you. The guidelines talk about provide options for recruiting interest. Guideline seven, subpoint 7.1. Optimize individual choice and autonomy. 7.2, optimize relevance, value, and authenticity. And 7.3, minimize threats and distractions. Tons of research has been done here in this room on how do we recruit kids' interest. And there are such things as um, optimizing the relevance, value, or authenticity. We, we know what to do to make things more important to a kid. Um, uh, another key thing is provide choice. Choice is a vital part of engagement, and school tends to not provide enough choice and so on. Secondly, provide options for sustaining effort and performance. How do we keep kids performing? Guideline 8, subpoint 8.1. Heighten salience of goals and objectives. 8.2. 
vary demands and resources to optimize challenge. 8.3, foster collaboration and community. And 8.4, increase mastery-oriented feedback. So then there are options, again, from the research in this room about how do we make the goals more salient so they're more sustained so kids can remember, why am I doing this at all? How can we use the social uh, uh, environment of a classroom to scaffold a kid to be able to sustain effort and persist because it's not just recruiting interest? And thirdly, guideline around self-regulation. Guideline 9. Provide options for self-regulation. Subpoint 9.1, promote expectations and beliefs that optimize motivation. 9.2, facilitate personal coping skills and strategies. And 9.3, develop self-assessment and reflection. We don't actually want kids who are dependent on us to set up an engaging environment, or even on their peers and even on uh, the kinds of clear goals that would sustain performance. What we want are kids who are able to set good goals for themselves, to be able to regulate when things go wrong, to be able to sustain and handle frustration and all of that. This is hard stuff, but that's where we need to get, because what we don't want are kids who are dependent on their school. We want them to be uh, independent self-advocates who know what's a reasonable goal for me and know how to monitor uh, their progress and all of that. Those are the guidelines here, again, from research largely in the room. These things are all very developmental. And a, a book I wanted to highlight that's old, but that is fabulous, is called Developing Talent in Young People by Benjamin Bloom, the guy who did the, the work, Bloom's Taxonomies, that you're all familiar with, probably. A book cover appears. Developing Talent in Young People. The dramatic findings of a groundbreaking study of 120 immensely talented individuals reveal astonishing new information. Edited by Benjamin S. Bloom. Bloom did this wonderful thing about what kind of teachers you really need. Oh, in fact, uh, this gives me an opportunity to say, Bloom's taxonomies, people are not aware because the funding ran out, just a caution to OSEP, the funding for Bloom's taxonomies ran out. He actually had three books planned. The first was about representation, the second was about action, and the third was about motivation and engagement. Who knew? I didn't know that till I went back and did the research. There was a third volume that didn't get published, and I'm thinking, now that's the most important one, that Bloom's taxonomy, he meant to talk about motivation, engagement, those as critical to any educational environment. So, um, but in this book, he talked about, well, you need several different kinds of teachers. So I want to use my experience as a trumpet player um, to talk about these three kinds of teachers. When I was a beginning trumpet player, never played a trumpet, um, my mother really wanted me to learn piano. So she sent me off to a... Uh, piano teacher. And I came home and I said, gee, I really want to play trumpet. And my mother, a absolutely gifted teacher, recognized that the right thing to do is look at the guidelines. The engagement guideline slide is shown. Actually, I've paraphrased all the UDL guidelines from my mother. She said, I've got to give little Davy some choice here. So she bought me a plastic little trumpet that had four valves. You couldn't play anything that had more than four notes, and they were just written out in a little uh, pamphlet, and it cost two ninety eight. And uh, that she said, "Well, take that and have the music teacher do that too." So for three or four weeks, I did my real piano lesson, and for me, my real trumpet lesson. And you can imagine how horrified this music teacher was with this plastic trumpet and no, not even any notes or staves. At any rate, it must have been awful. But as it turned out, I liked the trumpet better, even though it was stupid. And um, because, in fact, the teacher did the emotional part right, which is recognize, okay, this little guy, the important point isn't piano. The important point is music. I want this little boy to like music, and I'm going to do whatever it takes. If he wants to do that plastic, stupid trumpet, I'll start there. So great, she followed all of these guidelines. Guideline 7 provide options for recruiting interest. Then the question is, how do I sustain this? Now I have to actually practice. The first teacher um, is all about emotion. 
The first teacher is how do I emotionally get a passion for this, that I care about it? The second teacher is about technique. You actually need to learn skills to be able to do things. And so the second guideline is about how do we sustain? How can kids sustain so they can practice and get good at things? And so there are some guidelines here. Guideline eight, provide options for sustaining effort and persistence. One is clearly, the big thing for me was that I went and got in a band. The whole social thing of being in a band and having a girl I had a crush on and all these things were a really key part of sustaining the, you got to practice every night. And all of that seemed awful at first. And then because I wanted to be a, a good player in the band, I practiced and practiced and there was other things I did. Then I got to high school and we were in a competition. And my, I was at, I practiced a lot. And by this point, I was the top trumpet player in my school. And um, we were in this competition. And afterwards, we didn't win. And the comments from the judge were specifically addressed and said, the solo trumpet has good technique but lacks music. And I was stunned because it was so personal an attack. And I was the best trumpet player in the school. And I thought, how could I be bad? Um, but Later, our, my band director talked to the coach, I mean, to the judge, and he said he needs a new teacher. So in Bloom's taxonomy, I'd had the first teacher, which got me to like music. The second teacher, my band guy, got me to do some techniques so I could play a little bit. But now I needed a completely new teacher. And the third teacher is a tyrant, which is just an incredible idea for all of us. But I wanted to emphasize it because we often are accepting, especially of kids with disability, with okay. We've got to get kids with disabilities to not okay, to have a tyrant teacher about something that says, no, that's not good enough. That's not music or whatever it is that we want them to be good at. So the tyrant is the final teacher you really want. So let me tell you what happened to the tyrant teacher. So I didn't know this is what I wanted. I went to, uh, so I was given a new teacher or suggest I go to this new teacher. I go to another part of town and never been there. And I walk in and he says, okay, play something for me. So I played my best piece. It was fabulous, I thought. And he just looks, so they finish it. He looks at me and he says, do you play anything well? <laughs> so that's the beginning of the tyrant teacher. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> and he says, I don't know if I'll take you. He said, uh, you got a long way to go. You got a long way to go. He said, go away for two weeks. If you come back, and you can play something, I might consider taking you. But he said it's going to have to be twice as fast and twice as musical. I had no idea what the second part meant, but I knew what twice as fast meant. And I started to practice two hours, then three hours a day, because I was furious that someone would say, I can't play trumpet, because I built up a lot. This is years and years. This would have been a horrible first teacher and a horrible second teacher but a great third teacher. I came back two weeks later, and I played it twice as fast. It wasn't really twice as musical, but he said, okay, I'll take you. Let's work on the music. And so the next part was all about the music, which was fabulous. And just to uh, brag, I ended up uh, playing in Carnegie Hall and premiering, I'm not going to play it, I thought I thought of playing it, uh, Aaron Copeland's um, Aaron Copeland's um, Fanfare for the Common Man. And uh, I was there at the premiere for New York State, and I played a wrong note. It was so humiliating, because Aaron Copeland was in the audience, and I like <laughs> ran out afterwards. Um, but at any rate, that, uh, that worked uh, in the end. Um, I want to stay here for a moment, because music, um, its primary role is emotional. And here's a couple of quotes. A slide. Music mimics the dynamics of emotion itself. Suzanne Langer. Music sounds the way emotions feel. Carol Pratt. The reason a composer, including Dan Elsie, is writing is to make you feel something. So this is a really key thing. And uh, I wanted to uh, play another piece. Uh, this is Lady Gaga. We're getting to the good part of the talk for some of you. <laughs> This is the TV show Glee, which I had never seen before getting ready for this talk. And a kid, of course, told me, watch the Glee cover of the Lady Gaga song. Um, so 
this captures in an emotional way, I think in a musical way, a large part of what I've been talking about and what I think we're doing. So I need to do just a little setup um, that for those of you that don't watch Glee, um, Glee is about a group of people who sing as a Glee club, but they're kids who are marginalized. They're not the cool kids. There's the social kids, the really cool kids are another group. These kids are outsiders for some reason. Uh, and they've been brought together by their singing. And uh, you'll see they're going to show you what it is that feels not right about themselves. And you'll see things like nose. And it's that everybody who watches the show knows that she's been wrestling with a nose job. She, she, she wants to look better. And another one has trouty mouth. And it's like he's embarrassed about the way his face looks. There are people with disabilities. There's everything. Watch how rich the texture of this is. Lady Gaga's uh, Born This Way as done by the Glee. The clip begins with a young man alone on stage. He wears a red plaid flannel shirt. It doesn't matter if you love him or capital H-I-M. He spells H-I-M using sign language letter symbols. Just put your paws up. Because you were born this way, baby. Two girls come on stage and open the flannel shirt. Underneath, a t-shirt reads, likes boys. The three dance and sing as others watch from the wings. My mama told me when I was young, we we're all about superstars. She rolled my hair, put my lipstick on, in the glass of her boudoir. A black girl shirt says, no weave. Nothing wrong with loving who you are, she said, cause he made you perfect, babe. More teens join them. So hold your head up, girl, and you'll go far. Listen to me when I say... About a dozen kids dance, including a boy using a wheelchair. No mistakes, I'm on the right track. Baby, I was born this way. Don't hide yourself in regret. Just love yourself and you said, I'm on the right track. Baby, I was born this way. The original soloist throws his flannel shirt off stage and vogues. Don't be a drag, just be a queen. Whether you're broke or evergreen. Your black, white, beige, toad, leather scent. Your Lebanese, your Orient. Whether life disabilities left you outcast, bullied, or teased. Rejoice and love yourself today. Cause baby, you were born this no way. No matter black, white, or beige, chola, or Orient made. I'm on the right track. More singers reveal their t-shirt labels. Can't Dance, Brown Eyes, Four Eyes, Lucy Caboose, Trout Mouth, Bad Attitude, Nose. Backstage, a teacher reveals her OCD shirt to another teacher. In the auditorium, a girl looks at her own shirt, Lebanese. I need to tell you an inside joke. Uh, the last woman who bears herself as Lebanese, it's actually a mispronunciation that other kids have done in making fun of her. It's, it's lesbian, and they said Lebanese. <laughs> she's, she's trying to decide should she come out as a Lebanese. Um, <laughs> The last thing um, I want to show is um, uh, a fabulous book that I discovered only in doing this talk. It's brand new, and it's called Extraordinary Measures, a wonderful pun. Um, and the author is Strauss, S-T-R-A-U-S. And its subtitle is Disability in Music. A gorgeous book, one of the best books I've found in years. And it has a UDL message that's unbelievable. The first two-thirds of the book, is musical narratives of composers with disability. What I love, he starts with Beethoven. A slide. Beethoven, Bach, Schoenberg, Webern, Stravinsky, Bartok, and Copland. Talks about Beethoven's Eroica. And you know what? Beethoven's Eroica was written, some people think it's about Napoleon, but he digs up the evidence to show it's very clearly about Beethoven come to grips with his deafness and what is the heroic struggle is figuring out, I can make 
great music and be deaf. And it's just a fabulous exposition of this. So uh, Beethoven, Bach was blind, uh, Schoenberg, blah, blah, blah. All of these composers, the great pantheon of American musical literature had disabilities. It's a fabulous way to just say, and let's look at it. How does it get expressed in their music? He reads from a slide. Look at these for chapter titles. The last two chapters are called Performing Music and Performing Disability. Wow, what a title. And the next one, Prodigious Hearing, Normal Hearing, and Disablest Hearing. And what these chapters are doing is richly upsetting the apple cart. He'll take some of the things I've done here and he'll say, um, for example, uh, I'll just use one example, perfect pitch. Some of you probably know, the incidence of perfect pitch is much higher, very high, in individuals with autism, or individuals with Williams syndrome. Autism, I'm sorry, perfect pitch is a way of hearing um, that is part of a great spectrum of hearing, but we have narrowed our focus to relative pitch because that's what most of us have. And what he's showing is that we've lost something by not including all of those people who had a different part of the spectrum, this perfect pitch. Um, and he says music is lost for it. It's a fabulous argument. And normal hearing, he takes as too narrow. And he talks about disabled hearing as adding dimensions to hearing. I just want to, I'm, I'm near the end of my talk, but I just want to read a couple of the quotes because he writes so beautifully. I know this is a breaking the rules to read to you, but um, he writes beautifully. This is talking about Glennie, the uh, percussionist who's deaf, which is, she's always uh, a appealing figure. He reads from a slide. Because I had to concentrate with every fiber of my body, remember she's deaf, and brain, I experienced music with a profundity that I felt was God-given and precious. I didn't want to lose that special gift. This is her website. I like what she says. A homepage features a photo of a long-haired woman with a microphone and accompanying text. Welcome to the official website of Dame Evelyn Glennie, musician, motivational speaker, composer, educationalist, and jewelry designer. She's a musician, a motivational speaker, composer, an educationalist now. She likes to talk to kids about music and deafness. A quotation. Glennie's deafness has shaped the way she makes sense of music and produces music, causing her to attend to the tactile and visual aspects of sound. She sees and feels the music. She's doing multiple representations. She's seeing a richer spectrum of what music is, which is fabulous. Another quote. By attending in her performances to the sights and feelings of the sound she hears and produces, she performs barefoot and with extraordinary visual intensity. She makes her deafness visible to the audience, simultaneously performing her music and her deafness. What a beautiful line. Quotes continue. Disablest hearing is part of a larger effort within disability studies toward empowerment in which an oppressed and silenced group begins to assert the power of self-representation. Instead of trying to normalize people with disabilities, we listen to what they have to say. Instead of turning them into normal hearers, we learn to hear in ways that challenge normal hearing. My essential point is that the range of human hearing is wider than generally recognized. The boundary between normal and abnormal hearing is a construction, a fiction. He talks about it historically. We cannot begin to dismantle that wall until we define better what lies on either side of it. I want to get back to my point about universality, where I began. The quote continues. False claims of universality are the least attractive feature of the literature on music cognition, which moves too easily from showing that something is widespread to asserting that it is therefore normal, natural, and hardwired into the human brain. In fact, there are many kinds of bodies, many kinds of brains, and many kinds of musical hearing. In our theorizing and in our pedagogy, I think we would do well to acknowledge the limitations of normal hearing. So the last stage of, for me is 
realizing that the reason that we work with people who have disabilities is because we want to reform education for everybody. And it's that work that you have all done for years and years and years that will make education better. In the same way that Glennie talks about, if we really listen to people with disabilities, we will get to a better music, not just disabled music. And just to, to close, I want to, this popped up on my radar screen too. Um, this is the Glee cast. A slide. You may recognize them. They're going to now meet a school for the deaf. They're in a, a singing competition. And the socias, the, you know, the cool kids have made fun of it. Like, how can deaf kids, what's, what is that? They can't, why are they there? They just honk, literally is said in the show. Um, and uh, the Glee, you'll see the Glee Club, remember, who are kids who are used to being marginalized. They're sitting, they're listening to their deaf colleagues who are about to sing. The reason I wanted to end it, because I want to end with a Beatles song. So this is John Lennon's Imagine. An accompanist plays piano in a practice room. Strings will eventually join in. The uniformed deaf students stand together and sign as their soloist sings. The Glee Club students watch thoughtfully. There's no habit. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us, only sky. Imagine all the people. Today. A Glee Club student sings from the sidelines. Imagine, Imagine there's no, no country. It it's not hard, hard to, to do. do. Nothing to kill or to die, to for. die for. And no, and no religion, religion to. to. She joins the deaf singer on stage. He smiles. People, living life, life in peace. You, you may say, you may say I'm, a I'm a dreamer. The boy using a wheelchair joins the group singing. But I'm not the I'm not only one. one. The groups merge, hearing students singing and signing with their peers. The Glee Club director has tears in his eyes. No need for greed, no need for no hunger. hunger. A brotherhood, a brotherhood. A Adults in the room wave their hands silently in applause. I hate it that Glee gets it better than our schools. <laughs> uh, so I, I just want to end that I think the point of uh, Universal Design for Learning, for sure, and all of the work that you do is, um, I think, is best embodied in recognizing the limits of normal education. We aren't trying to make normal education accessible to kids with disabilities. It's a disabled kind of education. It's a narrow kind of education as it is. Kids with disabilities 
will show us how to make an education that will work for everyone. And we need to include them. He reads from a slide. Overcoming those limits will make education better, and I would say more musical for everyone. Thank you very much. As David Rose gathers his papers, the audience stands and applauds. Renee Bradley joins David and they hug. On screen, credits appear. Beethoven Symphony No. 3, Eroica. The Philadelphia Orchestra, Ricardo Muti Conductor, 1999. Courtesy Angel Records. Bach, Toccata and Fugue in D minor, Organ. From http colon slash slash www.youtube.com slash watch question mark V equal sign 9LRD1 hyphen 4U5Q0. Music animation by Stephen Malinowski. Courtesy Stephen Malinowski. Todd Makeover and Dan Elsie. Video from http colon slash slash www.ted.com slash talks slash Todd underscore makeover underscore and underscore Dan underscore Elsie, underscore play, underscore new, underscore music, dot HTML. Courtesy TED Conferences, LLC. <laughs> Cast of Glee, Born This Way, video. HTTP colon slash slash www.fox.com slash glee slash clip dot php Question mark BCTAG equal sign born plus sign this plus sign way. Courtesy Fox Broadcasting Company. Cast of Glee. Imagine. Video from http colon slash slash vimeo.com slash 10876120. Courtesy Vimeo. Piano Tone Graphic. Published in Athos, E. A. Levinson, B. Kistler, A. et al., 2007. Dichotomy and Perceptual Distortions in Absolute Pitch Ability, P. N. A. S. 104, September 11, 2007, number 37, 14795-14800. Use is free via open access, colon, http, colon, slash slash www.pnas.org slash content slash 104 slash 37 slash 14795 dot full a logo ideas that work office of special education programs 2007-2008